Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my presentation um, this evening is based on um, my PhD work over the past four years. And the title of my research is entitled Assess Assessing the Vulnerability of Tourism-Related Livelihoods to Tropical Cyclones in Small Island Developing States, a Comparison of Tobago and Jamaica. Uh, just to give some background, um, over the past couple of years and as time has gone by, natural disasters have caused um, a lot of losses. And over the period 1980 to 2011, 3.5 trillion US dollars have been attributable to natural disasters. And a lot of times the lower income countries tend to bear um, a lot of the effects of these events, particularly with hydrometeorological events, um, which my research is focusing on. I'm focusing on hurricanes and tropical storms. And what does this mean now for the context of uh, the Caribbean that is within the hurricane belt um, and the fact that we also depend on few sectors, sometimes one or two sectors. In this case, I'm looking at tourism. Uh, the tourism sector is very important to the region, as you could see. Um, it contributes to GDP and a high amount of jobs within the region. It is one of the most dependent, tourism dependent regions in the world. And a lot of our coastal infrastructure is located, a lot of our tourism infrastructure, sorry, is located on the coast, where it's susceptible to sea level rise as well as coastal flooding. When hurricanes do occur, they cause infrastructural damages, monetary losses, a decrease in tourist presence, and it severely affects economic activity. So because of this, I've chosen to concentrate on livelihoods, which are the backbone of the tourism industry, to find out how vulnerable tourism workers are to these events. So even though an event might occur um, within one country, for example, a hurricane might pass over Jamaica, there is unequal exposure within this country. There might be some communities that might be more or less vulnerable. And the importance of doing community level studies such as this is that it puts a focus on the local impacts so that you could have more successful localized interventions at this level as compared to national data, which just aggregates everything together. So it's important to do a grassroots approach to find out what is happening at the local level. And normally in disaster risk management in the past, there was a concentration on the hazard. But with comprehensive disaster risk management, you must find out what are the factors influencing vulnerability. And that's what my study focuses on. So just to put my study into context in terms of the literature and why this is necessary and where I saw a gap and why I did this study, as you can see to the top, there are a lot of studies that focus on tourism and natural disasters, but a lot of the times this is in the context of terrorism or tsunamis, earthquakes and fires. Very few times they talk about hurricanes. And as you can see, studies that concentrate on natural disasters and small island developing states, there are few studies. And in terms of livelihoods and vulnerability, a lot of the times when livelihoods are studies is done in the context of climate change. So the change that my study does is that it focuses on a natural disaster, which is hurricanes. Now, there are different methods that you could use to measure livelihood vulnerability. And the one that I chose, highlighted in red, is a hand study conducted in 2009, where they measure the vulnerability of agricultural livelihoods to climate change. Um, this was replicated in other countries as well. Um, Campbell actually used the study here in Jamaica, but in the context of agriculture. Etwire in 2013 used it in Ghana, and Shah used it in Trinidad and Tobago, but also in the context of agricultural livelihoods. So what I found is that there was not a major focus on tourism livelihoods, and that's why I chose to, to do this study. So my aim and objectives is to assess the vulnerability of tourism livelihoods to tropical cyclones in the two selected countries. The main objective is to compare the socioeconomic and environmental factors that contribute to vulnerability in the selected sites, to develop an instrument to measure vulnerability of livelihoods, and then use this instrument to tell the differences between different livelihood groups as well as gender. 
So in reference to the conference and the sustainable development goals, my research takes a look at three of the sustainable development goals, which is decent work and economic growth. So through this research, it's ensuring the protection of livelihoods, and there will also be measures suggested to um, ensure decent work for everybody. The second component is gender equality. So there is a gender component where I'm able to differentiate vulnerability between men and women. Um, I'll discuss my results later on, but I hope to make some suggestions in terms of the gender component. And the final one is sustainable cities and communities. Now, in terms of sustainable communities, because I am focusing on four communities, uh, disaster risk reduction, which my thesis is based on, is an important aspect of having sustainable communities. Okay, just a definition of vulnerability. Um, it's there for everybody to see. It's when a community, it is what the characteristics and circumstances of a community that make it vulnerable. Now you have different characteristics or types of vulnerability. Your physical vulnerability will have to do where you're located, for example, along the coast, which will increase your susceptibility to coastal flooding. Social vulnerability, for example, has to do with population growth, migration, access to social safety nets, Economic vulnerability has to do with um, your dependence on sectors, whether you're dependent on, say, tourism or agriculture, um, your diversification, access to insurance and loans that you might need after an event. And environmental vulnerability has to do with the degradation of the environment, beach erosion, etc., which is very important in the context of tourism because tourism is based on our natural beauty. So if there is a lot of environmental degradation, it could affect the tourism product. And the livelihood, just a definition, livelihood comprises capabilities, assets, and activities required for means of living, and is considered sustainable when it can cope with and recover from stresses and shocks, in this case, hurricanes. I'm not too sure how many of you all are familiar with the sustainable livelihoods framework, but basically what it shows is a way to measure um, livelihoods and show it interacting within the context of vulnerability. So on the left, you would see livelihoods operating with the vulnerability context where you would have a shock. In this case, it would be hurricanes. Then you have your assets, social, capital, human capital, natural capital, financial capital, and these are poverty reducing aspects. Now, uh, individuals' ability to access these things are determined by different transforming structures and processes, governments, agencies, and depending on your capital and how you combine your capital, you're able to have certain livelihood strategies to produce more positive outcomes. So these are just my study sites. In Jamaica, it was Negril and Runaway Bay. And this is just showing over the study period for this study how many tropical cyclones and storms um, pass the study area. As you could see, Jamaica is highly susceptible to these events. And this is just showing some monetary values um, in terms of the damage. This is in US dollars that some of these events have caused over the years, of course. Um, Ivan being one of the most memorable and most recently, well, a couple of years ago, Sandy. Now, my next site is Tobago. My two sites there is Crown Point um, and Speyside. Now, Tobago has had a different experience with tropical cyclones as compared to Jamaica. Um, it's not as often, and there's less damage, um, but there has been um, some damage in the past. The most memorable was Hurricane Flora in 1963, and then Hurricane Ivan in 2004. Just comparing the both countries in terms of size and population, um, it's completely two completely different countries. Um, one author described Jamaica as having a moderate hurricane risk as compared to Tobago, which is described as having a smaller hurricane risk. The tourism industry in Jamaica is very different. It's well developed versus Tobago is still in the embryonic stages. Visitor arrivals completely different in Jamaica, two million in Tobago, International arrivals has fallen to about 30,000, which has changed in the past couple of years. Now Tobago depends highly on the domestic Trinidadian market to stay afloat. It just shows you the differences between GDP with the two countries. And of course, even though Tobago has a lot of uh, tourism and it's an important activity there, they still have the buffer of Trinidad and the energy sector to depend on. 
And there's also a difference in the source markets in terms of the tourists who come to both countries. In Jamaica, there's a strong North American market, Canadian and American. And in Tobago, there's a strong European market as well as the domestic Trinidadian market. And these are just the four sites. Um, the first site is Negril. Everybody familiar with Negril? It's a sun, sea, and sand destination. Um, it's the third most popular site after Montego Bay and Ocho Rios. And there's also the all-inclusive hotels in Negril. The second site was Runaway Bay. Also, sun, sea, and sand um, tourism. It's a bit different than Negril. It's more of a rest and relaxation town. They have a lot of villas as well as all-inclusives. Tobago now, 47.6% uh, of jobs depend on tourism as well as employment. It is a main driver of the economy and their governing body is the Tobago House of Assembly and it's also estimated that 70% of the population is employed with the THA. So a lot of people have two jobs, they'll do their morning job with the government and then they'll go to their tourism job after. Uh, in terms of the types of uh, um, Hotels there is smaller hotels, um, bed and breakfast. The all-inclusive hotels is not a large part of the tourism industry in Tobago. The locals are still very much involved in the product. Uh, Crown Point, this is the first site. This is the hub of tourism. Um, it's the sun, sea, and sand product, of course. And within the site, there's the Buka Reef Marine Park and the Nylon Pool, which is an attraction for a lot of people. And because of that, it creates a lot of livelihoods. There are a lot of daily boat tours to the area. And the fourth site is a bit different from the pre three previous sites in that there is a sun, sea, and sand product, but it is a popular ecotourism destination, a lot of bird watching, diving, and uh, there's also the rainforest nearby, which is the oldest declared forest reserve in the Western Hemisphere. And if you could see on the right bottom picture, that is the largest brain coral in the Western Hemisphere. Now this area also has a history of landslides and when I talk to persons in the area, there were times where the town would be cut off on both sides and when they need to get tourists out of the town because of heavy rains, they would have to use boats to be able to come out of the town. So my methodology was mixed methods. I used mixed methods because the qualitative methodology helped me to understand what factors influence vulnerability, but then I had no way to tell difference in vulnerability. Um, between groups or gender. So in order to do that, I had to have a quantitative component. I used what's called a sequential exploratory design, uh, where you have the qualitative component first, and then that helps inform the quantitative, the development of the quantitative aspect. So the qualitative aspect, I did semi-structured interviews with persons whose livelihoods are directly dependent on tourism at each site. I focused on three sectors, accommodation, craft, and water sports, as well as with key informers, NGOs, government departments, agencies, and I use purposive sampling as well as snowballing to target the persons. And then for my phase two, I based this on the hand study in Mozambique, and there were different categories that that study had. I was able to use my qualitative information to create some new categories to create a tourism livelihoods vulnerability index. Now, I talked a bit about this before and why it's a new contribution to the literature. In my case, um, most of the studies using this approach uses looks at agriculture. My own is looking at climate change. Sorry, my own is looking at tourism to natural disasters, and it's using a mixed methods approach. As I said before, this is a grassroots approach, given a true understanding of the challenges at the local level. So this is just when my interviews were done, how many were done, this is for the qualitative, and then I used in vivo to do coding, to do thematic analysis. Now I'm going to talk about my results, my qualitative results first, just by site. So these were some of the factors influencing vulnerability at each site in Negril. Of course, there's the coastal location, which puts the town at risk. There was ecosystem and environmental degradation, beach erosion, overfishing pollution, and this is based on what people told me. Um, migration, there are a lot of people coming into Negril, um, which increases the competition. A lot of people selling the same stuff as not only competition between, say for example, 
craft vendors, but with the all-inclusive hotels, there was an overall tone of negativity, particularly from locals who had who did not like the concept of the all-inclusive. They feel that the foreigners came and they, they took away the tourism from them. There was a lot of financial difficulties as well, particularly for the craft vendors. A lot of them were unable to make ends meet, particularly within the slow season. And people talked about the seasonality of tourism and the extension of the slow season over the years. In Runaway Bay, it was a bit different. It was generally a successful tourism product. Um, there were less difficulties reported. They had a good water supply. They also had less reports of damage associated to storms as compared to Negril. In Tobago now, some of the factors influencing vulnerability was transport, difficulty of getting into the island. Um, you could come via ferry, but a lot of the times there are two ferries, one ferry will be down, the next one, there are always problems. And then Caribbean Airlines is the monopoly and they're the only one that fly in from Trinidad. Sometimes it's difficult to get a flight in, so a lot of hoteliers will tell me they have, to, they have people coming in, but then they call last minute and they cancel because of the transport problems. Also in Tobago, they talked about a decrease in tourism profits over the years, less international tourists. Um, the domestic Trinidadian market has picked up that slack, but there is a difference with the Trinidadian tourists and the international tourists. Usually the international tourists would spend more money as compared to the Trinidadians. And there's also a service problem in Tobago in terms of how, to, how tourists are treated. And this is probably related to the fact that even though Tobago is dependent on tourism, a lot of people have a second job with the government. So they might not see it as important to give good service. And then there were also some water problems in the dry season. There was also a problem of seaweed in Speyside. Now, I did these interviews in 2015. And uh, this was around June 2015. And the seaweed affected the livelihoods because a lot of people were leaving the area to go to Crown Point because they can't swim, they can't dive, and they were losing profits because of this. But this just shows how tourism as an industry is susceptible to shocks, whether it is seaweed or it could be a natural disaster. Now, this is my quantitative work. This is how many people I interviewed at each site. And now what I got here is my results for the quantitative. So this is a composite index by different subcategories. So there are scores where I can compare water at all the four sites, um, natural disaster score, et cetera. And then I had a final score for all four sites. Um, the most vulnerable was Negril, and the least vulnerable was Crown Point in Tobago. Now I also compared gender. In both sites, um, females were a little bit more vulnerable than males, but in Jamaica, this difference was a little bit more. Now, in addition to the composite index that I just showed, um, this methodology also uses a LVI, Livelihood Vulnerability Index, IPCC results. Now, exposure, adaptive capacity, and sensitivity, these are the contributing factors towards vulnerability. So what I did with the subcomponents that I had before, I put them into these three categories, and I was able to calculate uh, a score. So what this did, it gave a disaggregation according to exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And as you could see, I'm not too sure how good you could see, but Negril had the highest score for exposure and sensitivity as well. And uh, I like this methodology because it shows the results in a different way. You're able to compare it based on exposure and sensitivity and who has the most or least audacity. So um, this is the stage that I've gotten in my research. Um, I haven't really started my recommendations as yet, but just off the top of my head, I wrote down some things that could be suggested. And this is just for craft, because I did concentrate on craft for my quantitative results. Um, providing increased access to financial safety nets. A lot of people talked about how difficult it is to get loans. Um, and of course, insurance. And in Jamaica, I found that the craft vendors in Runaway Bay who were based at the all-inclusive hotels, they were very successful and they had low vulnerability scores. So there needs to be some sort of sustainable linkages and partnerships with the larger hotels um, to help 
say for example, persons at the Negro Craft Market who complain about no tourists coming to visit. Um, and then there also needs to be training in better business management, customer service, marketing, etc. But as I said, I haven't really touched this part as yet, but these are just some insights off the top of my head. So that's, that's it, my acknowledgements, my sponsors of my scholarship. Thank you. Here we are discussing the sustainable development goals and the, how it is related, tourism is related to the livelihood of the people and its vulnerability and the difficulty to obtain financing. That's always a major problem for small business people. Micro enterprise to obtain financing to improve on their service or on the product because the banks see them as high risk. Although small amount of money they want, I'm sure less than 5,000 US, but here yeah, they are seen as small returns. And on, on the study, they highlight that. So I'm sure you would have some comments to make. So I want to thank you very much for your presentation and wish you every success in your PhD research. And so now I will move to the second um, panelist, Mr. Christopher. Corbyn and they will look at the, the role of a legally binding convention for the, for the wider Caribbean and delivery of SDG 14. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and welcome to all participants. Uh, maybe I could start off just by a, a little plug. I think there again we are creating environment and climate change as a, as a sector, and maybe in the organization of the themes, we could have had maybe a little bit more cross-fertilization in terms of maybe having a social or an economic-minded person being part of this panel, but just, just, just an observation and, and maybe something we can look at for the next time. Um, I, I wanted to start off with a, a bit of a question, which I hope that we can all answer in terms of the largest source of protein, 80% of our oxygen based on economic value, the seventh largest economy in the world. Thank you. Oceans. And oceans because of the multiple number of services that they provide, both at a national level, a regional level, a global level, and particularly at, at local communities. And, and these are a set of of infographics that are recently being developed by the Nature Conservancy, which I found particularly informative. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's the sort of argument that we need to make more of when we are starting to make the justification for environmental management. And specifically, if you look on the left, it also calls upon how each particular stakeholder, whether they be private sector, governments, development agencies, or conservation groups, the different roles that they all have to play as stakeholders in this common resource. I, I, I took the opportunity, I was at a, a conference recently in Maryland, and uh, this was a quote that was originally made by a scientist from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in, in 2011, and it resonated with me. The oceans are becoming hot, sour, and breathless uh, for various um, reasons varying from climate change, um, ocean acidification, uh, pollution, uh, habitat degradation, a range of, of issues. And, and again, we need to be better able to communicate the impacts that we're having on the environment. And if we really are serious about attaining sustainable development goal, uh, related to oceans, then we, we also have to communicate that more effectively uh, to persons in general. I, I wanted to start off again, we are a multilateral environmental ag agreement, but I'm, I'm going to go through a little bit of a storyline in terms of who we are as a regional seas program of UN environment, and perhaps some of the areas of, of focus, some of our lessons learned, and perhaps some recommendations in terms of moving forward. We are the only legally binding regional agreement for protection and development of the marine environment of the wider Caribbean region. We are based right here in Kingston, Jamaica, and have been here since 1981, formally established in 1983 as a legally binding agreement known as the Cartagena Convention. 
Our areas of focus are quite broad, mostly dealing with pollution from land, from ships, from air, from riverbed and mining activities, from dumping at sea, and for the protection and conservation of coastal and marine biodiversity. It's supported by three agreements dealing with oil spills, uh, specially protected areas and wildlife and land-based sources of pollution. And our scope is, is quite broad, and, and we think that that's extremely important as a region, as a Caribbean region, not just for the Caribbean small island developing states, but also because the Caribbean Sea borders um, Central America, South America, North America. So despite everything, they are critical stakeholders. And if you also consider our dependent territories, Guadeloupe, Martinique, the US Virgin Islands, Aruba, Curaçao, and other members of the kingdom, it really means that if we are talking about protecting the Caribbean Sea, we really need to have all hands on board, so to speak. As I mentioned, we've been established as a regional seas program by the governments of the region, for the governments of the region uh, since 1983. And therefore, 30 plus years and still going strong, many failures, yes, many successes, and perhaps some ideas in terms of how do we remain relevant as an environmental agreement as we're starting to talk about issues such as sustainable development goals. Our mission, and I, 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 when I went through our mission and was preparing for this presentation, I, I thought, oh, we've been talking about this as well. Uh, regional cooperation, uh, sustainable development, economic growth and sustainable livelihoods, messages that we all heard this morning from our esteemed speakers, and things that we have to continue to maintain in our mind that it's not about environment versus development. It's about environment as an enabler of, of development that is more sustainable. And therefore, how can we focus on those environmental related goals uh, and therefore ensure that we are also addressing issues of poverty, health, education, economic growth? We heard a little talk about the Millennium Development Goals this morning, and as you know, the Sustainable Development Goals have been adopted at the highest level. And so for someone who's been in this maybe a little too long, I wonder, haven't we been talking about this before in other fora? Integrated planning, sustainability, sustainable development. Uh, this was an image um, which picks up on, on my colleague's presentation about the impacts of sargassum. And it is a significant impact, and it has been a significant impact for many islands in the Caribbean, significantly impacting on their tourism and their tourism revenue. This is just to remind all of us that, again, as much as the next few slides are going to highlight more on Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation and Sustainable Development Goal 14 on oceans, the difference is that these really are integrated and have to be looked at in an integrated way. And as a regional seas program, we have found ourselves focusing perhaps more on Sustainable Development Goal number 14 but recognizing that issues, particularly as it relates to water and sanitation, are critical in the context of protecting oceans. And likewise, if we look at goal 13 and goal 11, dealing with, set, with, de dealing with cities in general and with climate change, again, those are two things that no matter what projects and programs and activities we do, they cannot be forgotten. So I'm going to look a little bit in, in a couple of slides at the two major goals of, of 6 and 14. And as I went through this presentation, again, I wanted to highlight that there are certain issues that cross all of the sustainable development goals. And, and there are a few points that I wanted to emphasize in terms of the vulnerable populations, especially in developing countries most exposed to pollution. And then some figures on the right produced recently by the World Health Organization about the number of children that are killed by pollution, and, and in particular, air pollution. It is a major issue. So again, when we are looking at protecting or reducing pollution, it, it's not just saving our oceans. It's also having a significant impact on our health. Just to perhaps start with a couple of very short snippets. Um, and I do apologize, the next few slides may have images that would be considered disturbing, but I, uh, that's the caution. Um, 
for all of you who may not recognize this, this is a septic. This has been a, this is raw sewage that has been collected and is being disposed of in a Caribbean country. And yes, that's what you see right next there is the sea. Um, major concern, major issue as it relates to goal six and achieving goal six. And then the image on the short clip on the right is something which we as Caribbean countries all face in terms of the, our gullies, our rivers, and the amounts of solid waste that generally end up into our marine environment. But there are some positives, and, and here I, I'm showing a slide which is, which is emphasizing the importance and the opportunity that's being provided, for example, through the reuse and recycling of domestic wastewater. Whether for energy, whether for irrigation, um, there are significant opportunities, whether for nutrients, for fertilizer, there are significant opportunities if the right policy and legal frameworks are put in place by the region to take advantage of this domestic wastewater. If we continue to treat it, or should I say not treat it, these are the issues that we are going to have to deal with which are now prevalent in terms of the numbers of children being killed by diarrheal diseases and the damage being caused to our coastal and marine ecosystems by the discharge of untreated domestic wastewater, uh, both in the, in the context of high nutrients, high sediments, and also uh, significant uh, pathogens or disease causing bacteria. And again, if we look at goal 14, which is about our coastal and marine environment, the positive, the World Bank figures in a report that they recently released, but is based on data from 2012, the ocean economy in the Caribbean generated US $407 billion. And I don't think this, and this, I think this is an underestimate of the value of our oceans whether it be for tourism, maritime transportation, fisheries, coastal protection. Throwing this one in, it's, a, it's the reality that we also face in terms of our beaches. Almost half a million tons of land-based sources of plastic entered the, entered the Caribbean Sea in 2010, and this is estimated to increase to almost three-quarter million metric tons by the year 2025, a recent study done by Jambeck et al. And this is not the image we want to be associated with sustainable tourism. And this is the most disturbing one for us. Many people say water is life, others say sanitation is dignity. And this is again a real issue that if we are to look at improving life underwater, we have to improve life above water and our most vulnerable in the society. So what have we found as a regional seas program have been some of our challenges. And many of you, and it was said all this this morning, and um, some of the, the countries reiterated some of these during their country presentations just before this session. We need money, we need capacity, we need engagement, and we need information. And the money is coming from different perspectives. There is a bit of donor fatigue, because we go back to the donors and we ask them for money to do the same thing over and over and over again. We have the challenges of our budgets. We have the challenge of increasing revenue, um, you know, attracting investments, servicing debts. And what you're finding also is as agencies, we are shifting focus depending on where the money is coming from. Today it might be gender, tomorrow it's climate change, some other day it's something else. So our scope is changing. At the capacity level, policy, legislation, we're doing a little better. Regulations and enforcement continue to be challenging. And we always hear we are very good at developing policies. How do we move policy to action? Achieving sustainable development goals requires action. Not about discussing about our policy again. We've been there, done that. How do we jump? How do we overcome that hurdle? And engagement here is, 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 is done, and I presented that from, from two sides. Engagement in terms of we are consulting more, and are we really engaging more? We talk about involving the private sector, but do we understand how the private sector works? Do we understand how we need to engage them? And we heard the mention of the political divides. We live in a political society. We have to be able to develop programs that pass that 
cross over, no matter what political party is in power, the vision should remain the same. And then we have the issue with information, and some of it came up this morning. It's more than just availability. It's accessibility, it's quality. When we have the data, do we analyze it properly? Do we package it? Most importantly, do we disseminate it in a way that people can understand the science behind it? We have to be able to communicate more effectively. And I threw that in because it, the topic of the day is fake news and fake information. There is a challenge now of fake data because if you go on the internet and you Google pollution levels in a country, you're not sure what you're getting. And that really is a challenge for us. Interestingly, our success factors, because it's not all doom and gloom, there are some glimmers of hope which I think form the basis for us as a, as a program moving forward. We have been able to mobilize external funding even outside of our traditional partners. Uh, we've seen innovative financial mechanisms. We've heard of debt for nature SWATs. The Nature Conservancy is doing quite a lot of work, Minister, in, in your own country, Grenada, uh, in terms of blue bonds. We've recently completed a project jointly with the Inter-American Development Bank entitled Crew on financing for wastewater management. There's a very innovative financial mechanism here in Jamaica known as the K-Factor. And as we heard this morning, climate financing is available. How do we access it? How do we prepare proposals? We've done a lot of work at the policy end involving our universities. This conference, I, I, I think, is one such example. We've seen engagement getting better I dare say that at the local community level, something that has been more successful for us is working directly with local communities. We don't have to always go through levels and levels and levels of bureaucracy. We can work directly with where the, the, we have the, the, the biggest impact. And in particular on the issue of information, I'm in a position sometimes where I reach out to countries and ask them for information on things that may not, they may not necessarily want to share because it's a bit on the embarrassing side. How much of your wastewater is treated? What are your levels of pollution? And there's reluctancy in sharing that information. Other regions are not so reluctant and get resources. So I say that we need to maintain our pride, but we need to tell, share the situation as it is. At the same point in time, we have to celebrate our positive stories, our achievements, our lessons learned, and our best practices. We do not do enough of that. And I think there are opportunities throughout all of our countries where those can be showcased. I pulled this slide because there are so many images of the sustainable development goals. And this one, again, you know, showed the environmental link, the societal link, the economic link, and at the core of all that, are the partnerships, effective partnerships around all stakeholders. So our lessons learned in terms of maybe could be looked at as far as recommendations and, and moving forward. And I used the, the four themes that the organizers provided us in terms of what could be some recommendations. On raising money targets, we are still a little bit not talking, not singing from the same song sheet. We need common targets, we need common goals, and governments and UN agencies need to work together. We need to use the tools that the economists have and have been using for a while to better do our business case studies and our apply resource valuation, cost-benefit analysis. We need to be strategic in developing financing and sustainability plans. And it's not all about financial incentives, it's about value for money in terms of what the donors will come in and support. As far as capacity building, why are we training to do what and why? We need to be very focused. We need to maximize on our regional institutions. Right now, everyone is having some form of online training, online course. We need to maximize those, and we need to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the, of the training, particularly in the area of civil society engagement. It's about engagement and not just informing people. It's about empowering people and not making them dependent on where the next source of funds are coming from. And it's about finding solutions and not blaming, as we sometimes do. And in terms of building the evidence base, it is a complex system out there in terms of data and information. So we need to demonstrate what is the value of economic-based or evidence-based decision-making 
And then we need to select appropriate clean and green technologies, as I've said, at different levels. And I've added there, it's not just national level, it's not just local level. How do you make this relevant to individuals? And to end, it was, it is, it always will be about people, about effective governance, and about finding the the avenues through which we touch people's lives, whether it be fisheries, tourism, reusing water in agriculture, safeguarding our natural resources, and safeguarding our children's future. Thank you very much. We are here to help improve the lives of people. That, that is the fundamental of all that we do. The end result is improving the lives of our people. And so we see that the economic benefit of the ocean, and the need to preserve it and get the maximum use of it for the benefit of our people. In terms of financing, you pointed out some innovative financial mechanism. Uh, we in Grenada have been looking at um, blue bonds because we have developed a paper on the blue economy and seeking funding. In fact, the German government is prepared to provide funding to us. And so we need to, to look at creative ways of getting uh, resources. So thank you for your detailed presentation. And now I open the floor for comments and suggestions on the two presentations. Yes, I recognize you. Yeah, I, I, I listened to the two presenters. I think we're trying to do is strictly like some of my experiences. Like that. Our country is already in existence. I was sat like, although I'm a high level official, I was sat like in many discussions that where you have development already in place. And the thing is that these developments, they have a lot of issues. Yeah? Like if you look at tourism, the like tourism plan, you may say, look, you know something? You, may, you need to get in place a building status authority. But then they put in place, you, you find that the country is at a juncture where you have a lot of buildings not meeting those requirements. And the issue is who is going to finance those costs? Because already town planning were granted approval. Because in that case, to, you know, where in Barbados we, we have the construction of cement plant. And it was constructed near, like, you know, residences. And then the pollution emission in the air and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, right. But Tom Pannon years ago, because what's happened, environmental considerations only came into being, I think, since 1976. Right, 1976. But before that, you know, projects were approved. So who pays now? Who pays now to correct all of those problems? And that, I think in my mind that is the real issue. Hmm. I just have a couple of questions um, for Talia. Talia, yeah. All right, so your methodology, exploratory sequential, your quantitative was collected by questionnaires? Right. Questionnaires? Yes. And the question questionnaires, you say? Okay, so the first component was qualitative, yeah. right? And then I used that to inform the questionnaire, right? right? So I used, uh, so the first time I used and right. um, but so I didn't use anything to analyze the questionnaires. No, it was just through SPSS and then I made my calculations. Okay. okay. And um, mm -hmm. your the other presenter suggested that the weed use book was a glass of weed, was it? Right. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I had a third one in the past. Yeah. I found the um, report really interesting. Um, just to let you know, in St. Martin, in terms of tourism and you know, vulnerabilities and the like, uh, the country, 80% of its GDP is from tourism. 80% of the people employed are dependent on you know, tourism. Um, and the rapid pace of St. Martin in 40 years has been just you know, remarkable. If you look at pictures of St. Martin 40 years ago and look at it today, they're two different places. And, and just um, extending on from um, what was just uh, mentioned, the, the pace of development without rules, unbridled development, has had a, almost a uh, permanent effect on the environment in Sid, well, you know, on St. Martin. But um, there are good news coming out of this as well. 
um, it's not a question of um, having to try and rebuild what is lost, but to consolidate and move forward. And one of the, um, um, there are two things I think that's uh, really important from St. Martin um, in terms of a case study and lessons learned. Um, in 1978, we had a very destructive hurricane, Hurricane Martin, uh, Louise. It almost totally destroyed um, the economy. Um, and the country, um, or St. Martin, built from that uh, in terms of resilience. Um, putting all its uh, utilities underground, um, um, build stringent building codes for housing, um, and put into um, place um, really effective uh, you know, disaster response you know, mechanisms. And the other thing that came out of all this too is and it's something that has, I think has been um, under-emphasized in the, in the natural discussions now and in terms of SDGs is um, goal 16, effective governance. Because unless you get effective governance, um, it's very hard to plan and do anything. Um, in St. Martin, um, there's a historical transition um, from the Netherlands and to this an, an autonomous country within the <coughs> kingdom of the uh, Netherlands, which really means that St. Martin is completely autonomous in the management of its internal affairs. Um, and, and what is, um, unlike Curacao, um, which is like the federal system, and, and when the government was in Curacao and St. Martin was simply a government entity that just simply executed projects, um, they had no historical uh, um, precedent of policy making or strategic you know, you know, making. And the, the country was actually developed through the <coughs> of the private sector. And, it is, and, and, and the, the governance system in St. Martin is still very weak as much as the fiscal side. And there are two things that have come out of all this. One is uh, you know, sustainable development is not a government thing. You don't go to the politics and say, it's your responsibility. It belongs to everyone. And, and one of the lessons is that it's the private sector that really has to take the initiative on this. And, and they've got to see an actual intrinsic value of, of seeing sustainable you know, development is important for their bottom line. The, the other thing is, um, that we're looking very seriously at is the buffers, fiscal buffers, looking at it in terms of a microeconomic um, you know, area, is that, um, um, you know, like, um, it is, you know, predicted if we have another serious um, hurricane, it'll put two to three knots on the GDP just to try and, you know, restore and to, uh, you know, and to recover. And this has raises questions about keeping debt levels low below 35% GDP, creating fiscal buffers of 1% to 2% as, as a kind of a kind of insurance policy so that you can um, move forward. The other factor that came out of our studies was that social cohesion is so important. Um, if your societies are cohesive, they can respond quicker to disasters. Um, and that means looking after poverty, getting um, proper safety nets in place, um, that are you know very important. So, um, and I take it as that uh, the SDGs is a not isolated little thing, but integrated. And and but really at the top is, is effective governance, not just political governance, but um, inclusive uh, governance, the governance across the board. So I'll just share those um, initial. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, PS. You you made an extremely valid point in, in terms of the challenge that we face almost after the fact. And, and some of the things that we've seen in terms of approaches by some other countries is that the more sort of stricter environmental controls would be definitely imposed on new development. So any new development that, 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 that comes in has to meet that. Um, even here in, in, in Jamaica, I know like when they put some new regulation on, on emissions or, or effluence, they provided some form of, of grace period over which this would be implemented. But I would dare say, even with that, we have feedback, like some of the smaller businesses say, look, 
we just can't afford to go one cent over in terms of investment in some form of retrofitting or environmental safeguards. So, so this is where, and I take the, the point, now we need to broaden the discussion. Are commercial banks willing to give interest-free loans to retrofit, to put in energy things, to put in pollution re reduction? Are development partners willing to link a grant component with the loan component, with the grant component going towards those improvements in terms of environment? So I think, I think those, are, those are some of the, 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 the issues that we'll need to look at. I used to work in environment department, and then I was a little bit of a, maybe an idealist. We are not going to go back as a small island to how we were pristine. We have to make some difficult decisions and trade-offs. And it's a matter now of maybe viewing our natural biodiversity, our natural resources as an asset. And it's really about how does that asset contribute to um, fisheries, to tourism, to coastal stabilization, what's the most critical part of that asset we need to now protect? Not necessarily just for the short term, but the long term. So, so we really need that kind of discussion to take place more than it currently is. So that, as you rightly said, the private sector now sees that this is not only in the environmental interest, but this is in a financial sustainability interest as well. So, so thanks for, for, for that. Okay, in terms of the first comment that was made, um, what happens after the fact, for example, if uh, you said in Barbados a uh, um, cement factory was put there? This reminds me of uh, um, Negril, for example, where there is the beach erosion problem and the issue of the setback. Um, when I did the interviews, there were persons who said that certain hotels, certain all-inclusive hotels, um, would be allowed to remove parts of the beach or build closer to, um, to the shoreline despite there being certain things in place in terms of the, the setback. And unfortunately, sometimes it's the smaller man who has to bear the cost of these effects, even though it is written into law. Um, a lot of times there's politics and money that goes on behind the scene. I remember um, when I was interviewing one person, he said his issue isn't hurricanes and insurance for hurricanes, but more insurance for beach erosion. And the insurance companies do not want to insure for beach erosion. So unfortunately, it is the smaller man who um, has to bear the cost of, of these things. In terms of the comments, in terms of the comments you made, um, I agree in terms of effective governance. And I see the similarities with St. Martin and Tobago as well. Um, it's Trinidad and Tobago, but recently Tobago has been pushing for more autonomy, greater power to make their own um, decisions. Um, what I have seen in looking at the part of the hurricanes, a lot of the time um, the hurricane would go by and Tobago might get a hit and Trinidad wouldn't get a hit. And sometimes what is seen as priority for Trinidad is not, sorry, priority for Tobago is not priority for Trinidad. Now, the both countries have separate disaster agencies. Um, Trinidad has their disaster agency, and then Tobago has their own well-developed um, disaster agency called TEMA. So I guess that's why they're pushing for autonomy to have greater control over things that matter to them in terms of tourism, in terms of getting more money for marketing, etc. But um, I do agree with your comments in terms of how important governance is as well as the private sector. Yes, I sure. want to um, report the point of Mr. Collins in relation to retrofitting because the university has a project that um, is being organized between the university and the National Housing Trust in Jamaica to retrofit the National Housing Trust, which is a, a key element in, in terms of development in, in the country. Because once you know that the offices of the National Housing Trust have been developed, have been um, retrofitted, people want to go and do their houses the same way. So it's, it's, it's a positive move for, for, for the university and the National Housing Trust. I just wanted to put that on the table. Well, what do you think about the plans of an interest rate? I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a strategic move that would bring the banks and other businesses on board. 
that's why I brought it up because you need some sort some sort of a um, influence and the national yes. housing trust. Right. Think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they can really make a difference. Right. Yes. Good yes. afternoon. Right. Thanks to the presenters for a very comprehensive presentation. I have questions for both presenters. First one is relating to uh, your presentation. I listened when you spoke about the interviews that were conducted to inform your study, and I wondered to what extent you may have sought to validate what was said against what may have actually taken place. Because I realize a lot of times people's perception may not necessarily actually be what takes place on the ground. And secondly, I wondered as well about the vulnerability assessment generally, mm -hmm. if it was focused on what it is now, or were you adding a layer to look at the potential vulnerability in the future, particularly with projections for stronger storms to be more frequent, even if you don't have the number of storms being more frequent. And if you have, for example, more Hurricane Ivan or Hurricane Matthew happening in greater succession, I would assume, therefore, the vulnerability of the, the countries or even the communities that you're looking at mm -hmm. is likely to increase over time. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure about the time factor okay. of your study. Yeah. Right. And I guess for Chris, it's more a comment just to say that um, the, the SDGs um, there are perhaps more <laughs> connections, for example, looking at waste management, chemicals, etc., which you would find in some of the other ways that perhaps could strengthen the, the link, you know, trying to address some of the, the issues being addressed in that area. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good comments. Um, we take one going this round and yeah, fully panel respond. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the presenters and what you presented. Uh, but but I, I do think that um, in the in the context that Guyana, Suriname, in the century, and that we have more resource based, not resource based, the challenge of integrating the environmental agenda into sustainable development is a bit different. And um, uh, so I, I especially where natural resource based activities, mining and so on, and logging, uh, is uh, the heart of the economy. And um, is usually much more invasive to the environment than tourism. Now tourism can be invasive too, but um, generally mining is, is, is really uh, usually uh, playing havoc on the, on the environment. Um, but at the same time, it's what people have. And, um, the discussion um, is taking place as just like in Guyana five, six, seven years ago, where you have a low carbon strategy that tries to replace the mining and logging sector um, versus the old mining and logging sectors, which are those two are the most extreme positions. And um, uh, the question, of course, is. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Uh, which brings us to the next question, which is the issue of, I heard this afternoon, indicators and um, having your indicators ready to be able to access funding. Um, that is an issue. Um, Diana, I think one of the main challenges uh, in accessing funds they had was uh, getting, getting ready for the funding. Um, because unless you have the funding, unless you have the indicators, there's no funding. Um, we in Suriname have been busy getting Red Plus ready for I think the past three years. And last time I spoke to the concert, that yes, if we are Red Plus ready with the indicators, what is the time frame of getting funding and what are the conditions for funding? So I think these are issues that are um, uh, very pervasive issues, and um, they will determine to a large extent to if we are if we will be able to set out and map out a more environmental um, um, uh, uh, 
uh, positive agenda for development, you know, uh, because at the end of the day, you need to put food on the table. That was my In terms of bias and perception, now that is one of my limitations, so just in the interest of time, I didn't talk about limitations of the study. Um, it is based on perception, and perception is not always true. So um, you have to keep in mind um, that what you are getting, there might be some bias in it, but what I did to reduce the bias is that I made sure that I talked to a wide variety of persons. So within a hotel, I would talk to not only the owner or the manager, but also someone at the bottom level. That's within the tourism industry, but I also talk to NGOs and some governmental um, persons as well because I also wanted to get their perspective. For example, in Tobago, I talked to the environmental agency there. So that was one measure I tried to use to reduce bias. Um, but uh, when doing studies like this, um, you have to acknowledge that this is a bias, but it's not always a negative thing. It's good to do grassroots studies like this because you want to know what is the perception or what problems people on the ground are facing. So that doesn't mean you're going to take everything they say as true, but it just means you're going to take into consideration what they say, but now you could also combine it with other methods like scientific methods, etc. Right. So I hope that answers the first question. And then the second question was the issue of time. Now, this is a study based on the present vulnerability at the time of the interview. Um, I stayed away from the climate change argument, even though um, there are different um, reports of what might happen with climate change, whether it's increase um, the amount of events or intensity. So it did not take into consideration future events. It was just present vulnerability. And then I also asked um, persons how much they've been affected over the past 15 years by events. But it is really just a measure of present vulnerability. But in terms of future vulnerability and climate projections, that can be something that could be suggested for a future study. Thank you, Chair, and, and maybe just uh, to respond to a couple of, of the questions and, and comments as well. Uh, certainly, Leanne, I, I fully agree. I think generally in the area of pollution and, and negative impacts on the environment, and particularly as it relates to our oceans, there, there are some real op opportunities. Um, many of the UN agencies are looking at the whole concept of, of, of green cities, um, green economies, blue economies, and converting things like solid waste and wastewater to something with value. So it, it's really about how do we develop some of these business enterprises at a local com community level. Uh, the, the issue of, of indicators, I, I, I think, is a, a real significant challenge. And certainly, we have seen this even as we approach donors sometimes with project proposals they are not willing to provide the support for the solutions without you being able to convince them with baseline data that you have a problem. And sometimes they even doubt that you don't have this, this data. I say that at the same time, many of these donors also say they will, they will not fund baseline data generation. So I think this is a discussion that, that really has to, to take place where we, we need to be able to, one, justify and also collectively indicate why this is so important. But in doing that, I think it's also the balance between collecting data for data's sake, and maybe this is where greater partnerships with the academic and research community can come in to help direct their research too, to data that will actually help us get money for some of the project pro proposals. And, and, and I think one of the key things there, and it, and it speaks to um, your, your comment or question on some of the, the extractive industries, for example. And, I remember seeing a, a graph which basically said, as all of us go on the economic development path and try to improve, we are naturally going to have environmental degradation. And, and I think is that decoupling is what we have to focus on. Can we continue to have economic and social development without necessarily causing that invasive, and it, it's all about the appropriate technologies, it's about the training, I think it might have been in, in Ghana where I, I saw a, a mining that was, can't say it's clean mining, or oh, it was for, it was the forestry in, industry. And they had put in so many safeguards on reforestation as part of their product, but, uh, but again, it, it's how do you implement those? So thanks very much. For um, on the issue of Mr. Corbyn on baseline data collection, 
institution and the whole fact that the funders not want you to fund you and the whole talk of the war between you know that whole issue. Is there um, isn't that also tying back to the fact that we're also collecting the data for the funder and so therefore the research and the work is also put um, only targeting what the funder wants and not necessarily what we need as you alluded to in your presentation before in terms of where our focus is, it changes, you, you know, you craft a proposal according to what is the, the, the topic or buzzword. How do we deal with that? How do we, how do we address that and we're, we're still resource trapped? There are three countries in the Caribbean, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, where I have environmental agencies, whether you want to call them management agencies, protection agencies or whatever. So I just wonder, you know, the role of these agencies, because for me, as far as I know, they're supposed to have environmental impact assessment um, uh, protocols in place when mining is to take place or building is to take place and, and so on. So if these, these three countries have these agencies in place, then, then what is really happening? That is, you know, I'm just wondering because they're supposed to monitor, um, manage, approve, not approve um, some of these projects. In terms of the picture, if I looked at that type of environmental degradation, yeah, um, now within the quantitative aspect, because there was a focus on natural disasters, um, the quantitative aspect did not speak to that, but my qualitative aspect did. At, uh, I could talk about uh, Crown Point in Tobago and in Negril. I could say those were the two sites where environmental degradation came out, whether it was beach erosion in Crown Point, for example, a lot of people talked about in my qualitative data, they talked about sewage, untreated sewage being emptied into the Buco Reef Marine Park and what that means for um, degradation, the fish, the corals, etc. Um, they also talked about pollution, um, excessive use of the area as well as tourists coming out, stepping on the corals, etc. So it wasn't covered in my quantitative aspect, but it was definitely something mentioned um, in the qualitative component in terms of environmental degradation. And now, um, how does this affect the tourism product that we depend on? Because the fact of the matter is that um, there was a study <coughs> done by World Resources Institute in Tobago and St. Lucia. And there was a high percentage of persons that actually came to Tobago just to the coral reefs. So what does this mean now that we have sewage and effluent being released into um, the coral areas? And this is what we depend on for tourists to come. So if we degrade the environment, what's going to happen in 10, 20 years when this is our product that we depend on? So it, it is part of my, part of my research. Okay. Um, and, and thanks, Jen. And to the question on, on, on data, quick answer, yes. Um, we, we are not yet maybe fully at the stage of using or evidence-based environmental data for decision making. We, we have EIAs, we have environmental audits, but in the last session when there was talk about the challenge in agreeing on indicators for, for this, it's because there has been, I think, and that's a personal opinion now, a tradition in human development reports to have strong economic data, strong health data, strong education data, and so on. We have been doing state of environment reports for a while, so environmental information is not new, it's there. We have data and indicators. But how are we structuring these now in a more strategic way for the sustainable development goals? For me, that's where the challenge is. It's not like we don't have environmental data. We have been, been monitoring the environment from since I was at school, and that's a while ago. Um, but I think it's a valid point in terms of now how do we str strategically link these environmental indicators with the well-established ones that are that already agreed to in terms of health, education, poverty, etc. Um, general question on Ghana. I won't answer on the Ghana issue, but I think it comes down to the whole point again about, about governance, empowerment of your environmental regulatory agencies, um, enforcement capacity, and even when you have agencies, if they don't have an enabling regulatory legislative policy framework, then they are a little helpless. And I, they, yeah, sorry, thanks. <laughs> yes, you go to the next round. Good evening, everyone. Again, as I said, the presentations were very interesting. My question is to Talia. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in assessing the vulnerability of tourism, livelihoods, related livelihoods, I was wondering about those that operate out of the informal 
right. sector, yeah. um, given the fact that they would have more substandard buildings and they couldn't access funding for it right. and so on. So I was wondering, you know, how did that feature in terms of... Right. Okay, well, with my research, I did not actually focus on the informal sector. Um, with some of my qualitative interviews, I did talk to people who were part of the informal sector, and I got some of their views, and of course, things were more difficult for them. But I chose in my study to, to focus on the formalized um, Area. So, for example, for craft, I got an official list of the places that are designated at, as the craft, um, the, the designated craft areas. I mean, that is definitely an area for further research because a lot of the times with the informal persons, they left to themselves, they wouldn't have an association, they wouldn't have a social group, um, or they might not meet on a regular basis. So, they may be more vulnerable, um, but it, maybe it is something I, I should speak about, but I didn't specifically focus on um, the informal sector. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Um, is it your case for the NRP, National Resource Valuation, to inform uh, private sectors or financiers or investors in the whole environment Yes, um, and, and I'll like maybe elaborate a little bit because we have had economic valuation stu studies. My, my colleague made reference to one of them by the World Resources Institute, work done in Tobago, work done in, in St. Lucia. There's also been some regional work, but I think it probably now has to go a step further in terms of how do these economic and resource valuation studies actually become part of of, of business plans for certain types of investment? How do we better reflect the actual or internalize, as we say, the environmental cost? And it's not only cost, it's sometimes benefit. So, so I think there's a real opportunity for, for incorporating that. Traditionally, it has been looking at resource valuation, maybe in terms of impacts on coral reefs and on forests and on mangroves. But I think even we need to take that a, a step further. We, we did a small pilot study in Tobago and Trinidad looking at resource valuation to treat or not treat domestic wastewater. So it, it tried to show that by investing in wastewater treatment, the cost could actually be offset by the benefits in terms of protecting the environment, safeguarding human health, and providing an opportunity for more investment. And more of that needs to be done, definitely. I just got a question, perhaps um, branching off from um, good uh, data. It's about... Um, Small island, uh, small developing uh, countries accessing aid, uh, not just official development aid, but aid in general. And normally the criteria for that is on GDP per capita. Um, even if you're a high income, small island developing country or middle income, normally the damage from um, critical storm events or you know tsunamis or whatever is you know, disproportionate from um, bigger countries. And, and since a lot of discussion has been focused on you know, vulnerability and assessing what you know, vulnerability means as making it a factor that should be um, used in order to assess aid um, so that it can be fairly you know, distributed. I'd just like your comment on that because I would love that to be a recommendation coming out of this um, conference. I mean, it's an extremely valid point. Um, the, the small island developing states, both the Pacific and the Caribbean, have been making that case for a very long time and still continue to make that, that case in the corridors of, of New York and elsewhere. Um, you know, appropriate vulnerability indices, the fact that one hurricane can wipe us our entire GDP out for how many years. So, so it, it is really something that I think I don't know if the struggle needs to continue, yeah. if it's, it needs to minister, right. but yeah. it certainly is something that is very much needed for the, for the vulnerable nations, which according to GDP are graduated, but in real terms are still extremely vulnerable. As the CARICOM region, we have said to the EU, for example, that you cannot just use per capita GDP, because as you know how that is calculated, you look at your GDP divided by your population, and if you so turn out that it's over 10,000, well, you graduated. <laughs> so when we had the meeting with the EU, the Development Commission, I said, 
I went to him and said, well, you know, we made this case of vulnerability because in the case of Grenada, Hurricane Ivan lasted two hours and wiped out twice time with GDP. Twice time the GDP and 90% of the housing stock. So how could you graduate us when we have to take loans? Then the hurricane come, wash out all the bridges and roads, but the load is still there. It doesn't, it's, the load does not disappear. We wish we had a hurricane that could Washington. disappear in load. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, but they have, he said to me, well, you see, we cannot go to the EU Council with countries that G GDP lower than yours for support. <laughs> then they say, well, you asking us to give money to support Caribbean countries whose GDP is higher than ours. So most of the Eastern European countries that have joined the EU, they have no connection to ACP countries. They're not aware of the, the arrangement previously. And um, so they are not so inclined. In fact, they're insisting that you cannot give assistance to countries that is in the middle and up by income. And so the only country in the Cariforum region the carry from include the Dominican Republic. That qualify was Haiti. Haiti. No yeah. other country except Haiti. So we had to go and borrow, borrow money. So that has always been a case put forward by CARICOM. At the UN, at the SIDS Dock. Now we decide to approach it through SIDS Dock and the World Bank. And Grenada is now the chair of the Small States Forum, where you have a pledge. Two billion dollars, and during our chairmanship, which will be for two years, we will ensure that small island developing states could access these resources because it's not based on GDP. Um, and so, what we have to do is look at other areas and make the case at different institutions, like the World Bank, like the Green Climate Fund, that will consider our vulnerability, and that's where the money is going to come from. The, jet, the Green Climate Fund has uh, resources that we are helping small island developing states to access. So that is the new approach. And I think what you need is innovation, a new approach to financing. Because if you just stuck, we depending on the EU and they stuck to the principle, then you don't go anywhere. So it's, that is what uh, we are getting involved with. I, I, yeah. I think uh, with respect to the indicators, um, since you're right, uh, many, many donors are not willing to even fund the startup uh, and definitely not willing to, to fund the ongoing collection of, of indicators, uh, but it's very costly. And uh, I can give a quick example with support, a whole satellite deforestation monitoring into a setup. Now the money is, 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 is finished. We have a major problem continuing the unit. So I, I would say that um, we're not going to be able to change the donors at short term, but we'll be able to, to, to have the, the, the decision makers in the countries at least make a, a policy decision with respect to a set of indicators that they will fund. Because I mean, it's like the chicken and the egg. If you can get access to the funding, if you don't have this, the data, I mean, you, you, you start going in circles. So I think one of the options is to, uh, the statistical is all over the region have a problem. And you either put money in your statistics when it is bad, you know, or you decide not to put statist money in statistics and indicators. And then be worse off because I, I think that principal decision is, is a recommendation we have to take. As you rightly said, a core set of critical environmental in indicators that have cross links to all the other sustainable development goals that our, our leaders are willing to invest funds in the budget to sustain over time. I, I completely agree. Yes. The fact that these Caribbean islands continue to operate independently in whatever, whatever the issue is, whether, whether that should continue or whether we should now look towards a regional effort in terms of coming together to look regionally as a group, uh, some group, looking at each or, or helping each island um, 
helping each other individually, but it's 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 from it's not using the resources independently from each region. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but that is already taking place. It's taking place now. Okay. CARICOM yes, has brought all the member states together to look at the seven bits of sustainable development goals, 168 <laughs> indicators for different sectors, and say let us see what, what common approach. Because they because remember each individual Can you do Huh? Yes, yes, let me say it. Remember, the, each member state is CARICOM independent, we have the priority. But CARICOM has said, if the, on the, on those that we could agree upon, let us agree upon it and, and then seek funding for the region. Uh, as a UN uh, initiative, no? that um, uh, UN agencies uh, come together to support uh, the maps which represent the mainstreaming, acceleration and the policy support of SDGs. So that each country uh, has its own uh, national planning, uh, priorities, etc. So uh, we um, deploy the interagency missions to the countries based on the priorities that um, they have and identify a potential um, accelerator or drivers to uh, achieve the SDGs of each country. So in the Caribbean region, uh, the Jamaica was the first country uh, which received that mission. This year, uh, Trinidad and Tobago and also Aruba uh, had that mission. And now in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, we are planning uh, two missions, uh, Grenada and St. Lucia. So yeah, and some of the countries have already requested uh, similar support. So we will work with these countries. Let me, let me at this stage uh, thank the panel very much. I think they did an excellent job. And to you, thank you very much. I did not expect all these questions and comments. Thank you.